we're going to be in the New Testament. You can turn to the book of Acts. We find ourselves Acts chapter 17 this morning, and we're purposing ourselves on Sunday morning to go through the New Testament book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and finding great value and just taking the word as it is. And we, chapter 17 of Acts, verse 1, says, Now, when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollina, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying that this Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you, is the Christ. We find ourselves here is in the midst of Paul's second missionary journey. If you've got your bulletin, you can open it if you'd like to uh, follow along. We put a map in there, and you can see where we're at at this point. We're over in Thessalonica there, near the coast, and we just went through this great lesson on the example of how God, through the Holy Spirit, guides. And we saw this in chapter 16. We were looking at God's guidance through the work and the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit being the third person of the Trinity. And Jesus calls him the Spirit of promise. He's called the helper. And one of the main roles attributed to the Holy Spirit is the role of guidance. And as we looked at this idea of God's guidance through the power and the work of the Holy Spirit, we saw that it was through closed doors, through open doors. We saw that he has been guiding the apostles and the disciples through visions, through convictions. And this is the idea, you know, when we look at the the idea of the Holy Spirit, we come to understand that in the book of Acts, this is the major theme of this book, is the Holy Spirit. And we're looking at it as we kind of filter these lessons, we're looking at this as what it means for the believer to be Spirit-filled. And so this whole idea of, of being Spirit-filled and being led by the Spirit started actually back at Acts 1. Look back there. Acts chapter 1 Verse 4 says, gathering them together, Jesus had gathered his guys together, he commanded them, chapter 1, verse 4, to not leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which, he said, you heard of from me. For John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom of Israel. And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witness both in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest parts of the earth. And so we see here that after being filled and powered by the Holy Spirit, they were guided to be witness. So we're making this connection here of the Holy Spirit and guidance. So they were guided at this point to be witnesses here. And it says, verse 8, it's going to be in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even the remotest parts of the earth. And as we've talked before, this is our outline for the book of Acts. We saw that we were in Jerusalem, chapters 1 through 7. And then we were in Judea and Samaria, chapters 8 through 10. And then the remotest parts of the earth, chapters 11 through 28. And so we're in the midst of that place right now. And we also saw, look at chapter 13, that it was by the Spirit that Paul and Barnabas actually went out on, you know, what we call the, we clarify or classify as the first missionary journey. Chapter 13, verse 2 said, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then when they had fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and they sent them away. So as they embarked on these missionary journeys, it was 
the Holy Spirit that was guiding them. And I'm just trying to make this connection because I find this very applicable for the Christian today. As we see that, that how the Spirit guides, as we've been reading through the book of Acts, the same Spirit guides us in the same way. You've experienced closed doors. You've experienced open doors. You've experienced conviction in your life. You've experienced, maybe some of you, even visions. And these are dis- different ways God is guiding you through the work and the power of his Holy Spirit. And so we see here, chapter 17, back in our text for the morning, that it was the Spirit that had led them to Thessalonica. And it was through that whole experience that they'd gone to Macedonia. Remember that Paul had gotten a vision of the man of Macedonia, which turned out to be, it seems to be, a woman, uh, Lydia, and then her whole household got saved, and they ended up in jail. And you think, well, that seems to be a negative thing. But then because of their experience in the jail and the conviction of the Spirit to not leave when the door was open, that the jailer and his whole family was saved. And so they had this great experience. Now they have come down, we're traveling south to Thessalonica, and they find this group of people that are interested in God. It says, verse 2, that according to the custom, they went to the synagogue. Now, we've seen this over and over again, and we're going to see it continue through chapter 17 here, that Paul found it very effective ministry to when he would come to a city, a village, he would go to the synagogue, where he would find people that were interested in God, and yet these were people... We put some, if they were non-Jews, we put them in the category of God-fearer. We've talked about this. But these are people that were interested in God and yet had not experienced or knew the grace of God that was through Jesus Christ. So this is what Paul is bringing, right? He's bringing this message of Jesus as the Messiah. And ultimately, if we were to boil it down, it's grace of God. Grace through Jesus. And so... Here, I like this, we get a little bit of a a model or a method that Paul uses here. So first of all, he he goes to some that are interested in God. But then look what he does here. I find this helpful uh, when, even if you want to share your faith, you're like, how would I do this? Or what would be an effective model? End of verse 2, it says, we get a couple things here from him. He reasoned with them from the scriptures... Verse 3, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you, Christ. So a couple things, reasoned, explained, giving evidence, and proclaiming. This idea of reasoning here in the original Greek has the idea of dialogue. It's to have a conversation. So you think about your, you know, if you, you feel passion or you feel a burden to share your faith. An effective model to begin with is to have a dialogue. And what's, you know, think about it in this way. A dialogue or a conversation, there's exchange of information, isn't there? You're not just blasting someone saying, this is what I believe, this is why you should believe it. But a dialogue is you're, you're explaining, hey, this is what I believe. And then they're responding, well, what about this? And then you're kind of going back and saying, well, this is why I believe it. You know, and you're kind of going back and forth. And you're hearing the person back and forth. There's a conversation. So it says here he reasoned with them. He had a dialogue. But then, no doubt, there were some misconceptions of what they thought about God or maybe their interpretations of the Scripture because the Jews at the time didn't see Jesus as the Messiah. This was Paul's main mission. He was explaining Jesus as the fulfillment of these Old Testament scriptures, that Jesus really truly was the Messiah. So then what does it say? It says that he explained things to them. Explain. This has the idea to open. He used the scriptures to open their understanding. So you get the picture. They're having a dialogue. There's some misconception there. So he says, okay, let's open up the scriptures. Let, let me let me. Open your mind to the things of the scriptures. Again, it's all, we're going to see this over and over. It's Jesus Christ and the resurrection. He's going to go back to this several times. So he opens uh, their mind to understanding. And then he, it says here that he gives 
evidence. Some translations say that he demonstrated. What he's doing here is he's demonstrating how Jesus fulfilled Old Testament scriptures. And, and what he's taking, no doubt he probably uh, took the scriptures of Isaiah, several Old Testament Messianic scriptures that point to the Messiah coming, this prophetic Messianic scriptures, and he was probably pointing out, hey, look at this scripture. Jesus was the fulfillment of that. Hey, look at this scripture. Jesus fulfilled that. In fact, this is what Jesus did. Luke chapter 4, when Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, as was his custom, it says that he entered, Luke 4, 16, says he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he stood up to read. The book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book, and he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who were oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. He closed the book. He gave it back to the attendant, sat down. The eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This was the model that Paul had. Jesus himself going in the synagogue, pointing to the Old Testament scriptures, how he was the fulfillment of those. No doubt, Paul probably read from Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, verse 4 says, Surely our griefs he himself bore, our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the chastening for our well-being fell upon him. By his scourging, we are all healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that was led to slaughter. Could you imagine Paul saying, guys, look at this verse. Look at this scripture here. This is the Jesus that fulfilled these things. He says, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And for this generation... Who considered that he was cut off out of the land of living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? His grave was assigned with the wicked men, yet he was with the rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. So you get this picture here, and, and again, I'm just trying to point this out in a, in a practical way. I think this could be helpful for us as we approach people in the sharing of our faith. He reasoned. He, he dialogued. He had the conversation. And then he explained. He tried to open up their understanding. And then he gave evidence using the word of God. He gave evidence, the word of God. And then, finally, it says, verse 3, chapter 17, he proclaimed Christ. There was a point where he came to, he just, had, he just preached it. <laughs> he, just, he just preached it. So Jesus is the Christ. He's, this is it, man. This is the fulfillment of all of these things. And this was the topic. I, I love this idea, too, that as he's in this synagogue of this kind of this religious procedure, Paul didn't take on the topic of policies or politics. He didn't take on any of that. His topic was Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That was it. It's what he preached. And we're going to see this basically three times in our text this morning with three different people groups. I've titled this message, Received or Rejected, because what we're going to see are these three different people groups, the three different experiences. Some received the message and some rejected it. There's only two options. You can't hang out in the middle of the message of Jesus Christ and him rose from the dead. It's either you receive it or you reject it. Now, some did, verse 4 says, some then were persuaded and they joined Paul and Silas along with a large number of God-fearing Greeks and a number of leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and they set the city in an uproar and attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. One group received it and believed it. One group rejected and were dejected. <laughs> it says here that 
a large number came to faith. The Greeks and the women, they joined Paul and Silas. It's interesting to me that they list these Greeks and the women because in the society of these t- this time, these would have been outsiders. This would have been a, a group of people that would have considered not on the inside. Right? The Jews had this uh, particular, uh, I don't know the word, they, they had this, they were heirs to God. I mean, they were God's chosen people. They were on the inside. And to get to their God, the one true God, they would require to become a Jew and to go through these steps. And this is what the message that Paul was bringing, that it wasn't, you didn't have to become a Jew to become a child of God. In fact, we're going to get to this idea that we're all children of God by faith in Jesus. But these Greeks and these women, these were people who were outsiders. And now through this message of grace, they're insiders. And I love that verse we read a couple weeks ago, 1 Peter 2.10, said, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. And through God's grace, through Jesus Christ, we are the people of God. And God demonstrated through his son, Jesus Christ, that these outsiders, by grace, are now insiders. And they're, they're counted as part of God's family. But it says here that some became jealous these Jews, verse 5, they became jealous. Jealousy is an interesting emotion, isn't it? It's a powerful, powerful, interesting emotion. And I think it's important that we understand that jealousy is fear-based. And in fact, Galatians 5, when it's listing out the, the fruits of the Spirit and the deeds of our flesh... Jealousy is the deeds of the flesh. It is the outworking of our carnal nature. Jealousy caused these guys here to go against the work of God. I find this interesting because here it is. God was doing something cool among them. Right in their midst, God was moving. And yet because of jealousy... They were kind of blinded to this work of God. It was not only blinded, they went against this work of God. And so I just want to encourage you, I, I know this is sort of a, I don't want to get too sidetracked from our, our text this morning, but watch out for jealousy, you guys. It, it will bring you to ruin. And it'll, it'll blind you in, in certain ways that you will miss you will miss things of God going on in and around you. And you'll miss the joy of of you know, joining in joy of others around us. So these guys, they were jealous, and because of the jealousy here, they reject this work of God, and not only do they reject it, but it says here they went against it. They form a mob, it says verse 5. They set the city in an uproar. They're, they go on attack, and verse 6, when they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some of the brethren before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have upset the world, have come here also. And Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And they stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things, and when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. The accusation. They have upset the world with the message of Jesus. Some translations say that uh, they have turned the world upside down. (laughs) The the word world here literally means the inhabited earth. (laughs) This is quite the accusation, isn't it? I don't think it's wrong. Have you experienced Jesus as king of your life? Jesus as king of your life, guess what that does? That turns your world upside down. In fact, uh, it's been said that Jesus' kingdom is an upside down kingdom. Maybe you heard that before. Jesus said that in his kingdom, the first shall be last and the last shall be first, Matthew 20. He said also in Matthew 20 that whoever wanted to be great would have to be a servant. 
The Apostle Paul said that God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and he chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Philippians chapter 2 says Jesus was equal to God, and when he emptied himself, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. 2 Corinthians 8, Jesus was rich, and yet for our sake he became poor, so that through his poverty we would become rich. I don't think the accusation is too far off. (laughs) This is upsetting. This changes everything. When you truly believe that Jesus as king, if you put Jesus as king of your life, your world is turned upside down. Well, let me say this here. Here's my quotable for the day. His upside down is the right side up. Does that make sense? King Jesus is upside down. It's the right side up. That's where we want to be. So they're accused. Persecution comes. Verse 10, the brethren immediately sent for Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived there, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Here we go again. (laughs) We just just keep going. You look at your map there, Thessalonica, they go down a little bit to the coast of Berea. There, they just move on. They move on, and they're, they go in as practiced. And it says, now, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. It's an interesting thing here that our author Luke says. He says that the Bereans were better than the Thessalonians. Isn't that interesting to record that in our scriptures? But what made them better? What made these ones, these Bereans, better? It's it's so simple and so applicable for our lives. Verse 11. First of all, they received the word with great eagerness. Do you see that? No doubt, Paul probably came, I mean, this was as his customs. I don't want to go through the whole thing again, but he was probably reasoning, he was probably explaining, he was giving evidence, he was demonstrating how Jesus Christ was the Messiah. He was preaching Jesus and his resurrection. And it says that these believers here in Berea, they received the word with eagerness. Are you eager to receive a word from the Lord? Do you anticipate? Do you look for? Do you want to hear from God? Do you, do you eagerly, are you excited? Like when you come to church, now it's not about me, but when you come to church, are you thinking, man, I want to hear from the word. I want to hear from God today. I'm excited to see what the word of the Lord is for me today. They had an eagerness. Not only that, it says, secondly, there's just two things here. Two things. They examined the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Paul was bringing this, it was a new teaching. It was an interpretation of scripture that they hadn't heard yet. And it says here that they examined the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. You think about it from our perspective. The Bereans had the most famous apostle of all, you could say, author of, the human author of 13 of our New Testament books. And yet, they examined the scriptures to see what Paul was teaching was biblical or not biblical. This is a good word. And and, and it says, too, that they were doing it daily. I, I like one commentator points out that their research was not casual it had a certain character they examined the and they searched the scriptures it was worth it to them to work hard at it and to investigate what the word of god says did what paul say matched up with what the bible says i encourage you don't just take my word for it folks i do my best i mean i work hard at what i give you sunday morning but you need to know it for yourself And if I say something, you need to be able to examine the word and say, yeah, what Shane said was biblical. That's right. And and or other, you guys, we have myriads of podcasts. I mean, you can can listen to wonderful teachers online these days. 
Um, and you can, you can consume lots of Bible teaching. But don't just consume and take it as it is. Know for yourself. Is what they're preaching, is that biblical? Is that right? Do the hard work. It says here, they examined the scriptures daily to find out. It wasn't a one-time quick look. They made a point to be diligent and to extend their study. They searched the scriptures to see if these things, verse 11, were so. And for them, when they did, verse 12, what was the result? Belief. Therefore, for many of them, they believed. Again, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. For them, the Bible wasn't just a a book of poetry or or a neat historical account or maybe, you know, a, a neat little word for the day. The Word of God was life to them. It was the book of truth to find out what was truth. And so I would say to you, be a Berean. You've if you've been around a while, you've probably heard that before. But be a Berean. Be eager to hear from the Lord. I love this idea. Receive the word of God with great eagerness. Examine the scriptures daily for yourself to know. Be a Berean. So many believed, and with this belief, with the preaching of Jesus, there came persecution. It says that when the Jews of Thessalonica, remember the guys weren't as good as the Bereans, (laughs) found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul and Berea also, they came there as well, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Look what jealousy does. They form a mob, they go against the work of God, agitates people. They're stirring up people. And immediately the brethren, verse 14, sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. And now those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they left. And so they go to the sea. They set sail for Athens at this point. We're continuing south. At this point in history, Athens is past its prime. I don't know if you really know any historical stuff about Athens. At one point, the prime was the golden age of the Athenian was, was Athenian art, literature, philosophy, democracy, but this was five centuries earlier. And yet, though, these people, we will see here that they prided themselves in this idea of uh, intellect and philosophy. And we'll see here that Paul actually takes a little bit of a different approach with these ones. Chapter 17, verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he observed the city full of idols. Here we have another example of the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit. Paul has gone to Athens now. It says that the... that the city was full of idols. It, to do maybe a, a literal translation, we could say it was swamped in idols. We could say it was swimming in idols. You get this picture of idolatry everywhere. And it says that his spirit within him was provoked. There was a conviction, we could say. And it probably was this idea, too, that idolatry enslaves you. And and this is relevant and prevalent in our life today. We're not talking about like little wooden trinkets that we hang up on our walls. But things that we put above God, that we we get involved in idolatry, and the end of idolatry is enslavement. I mean, it just enslaves us. God is the only one who can free us. So no doubt the spirit within Paul is provoked because he sees this, this people group here that is just enslaved to this idolatry that, that the idols cannot give. There's a false hope. They cannot have a real help. And God is the one with a real hope and real help. So verse 17, he was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews. We've seen this custom before. And the God-fearing Gentiles. But here's something new. And in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be present. It's kind of an interesting new method for Paul. 
He was in the synagogue as well, but then every day he was in the marketplace as well. And this would be, I put this in the category of God's guidance that led him to do a different method. And also some of the Epicurean, verse 18, and the Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idler babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. So we want to know what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. That's kind of an interesting thing, isn't it? Don't we get caught up in that same thing, just exchange of information of something new? And today with the internet and the mobile devices, boy, we can find new stuff all the time, new articles, new ideas, new thoughts. And I don't know about you, but I scroll right past them. Oh, that was interesting. Moving on. Interesting. Give me something new. And yet it has no impact or no change in my life. It's just like, oh, that was interesting. These ones here were caught up in this ideas of philosophies and new thinking, new ideas. And Paul was bringing to them Jesus and the resurrection, something that would change their life forever, now and eternity. So what we're going to see here, starting in verse 22, is in your title, probably says in the Bible, the Sermon on Mars Hill. And they get this from that word in verse 22, the Areopagus, that was this, this hill named in this area, by the Romans, a, a Mars Hill. And so this is where this idea comes from, Mars Hill. It doesn't actually say that in your text, but that's what it comes from. So I want to point out something here, that Paul gets the opportunity, another word we could say, Paul gets to uh, a platform to preach Jesus. How does he get to this platform? I think it's a a result of this idea that Paul was being salty, right? He meets him in the synagogue, and then he comes to this marketplace, and he's preaching Jesus and the resurrection, and and they say things like, uh, you know, what is this idol or babbler saying? He seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities, and they want to know, verse 19, may we know this new teaching which you're proclaiming. Paul was being salty. He knew that these guys were philosophers. He knew that they had a certain, you know, intellect and a, and a way to dialogue. And so he approaches them in a way that would make them want more. And I'm just kind of making this point of being salty because Jesus says that we are the salt of the earth. Jesus says that we are the light of the world. We're supposed to let our light shine in such a way that it brings glory to God, that, that people will see our good works but give glory to our God or praise God. And, and the idea of salty, if you, if you get something real salty, what happens? It makes you thirsty. So I think Paul's being salty here. And he's, he's preaching Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus. He gets this platform or opportunity to preach Jesus. And so there he is in Mars Hill. This is verse 22. So Paul stood up in the midst of the Areopagus and he said, Men of Athens, I believe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and all things in it Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist. 
as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Therefore, verse 30, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. There it is again, Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Paul, in this sermon here, he covers four just basic, but they're profound, profound truths. Number one, who God is. Who we are. Number two, Number three, our responsibility. And number four, accountability. So number one, who God is. He clarifies right away that God is the creator and Lord. You see that in verse 24? It says, the God who made the world and all things in it, he is Lord of the heaven and, and the earth and does not dwell in the temples. Nor, verse 25, is he served by human hands. It says, look, middle of verse 25, he says that he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. Verse 26, he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth. God is the creator. God is creator and Lord. Everything that is, that is, is from him. And that includes us. So who are we? Who is God? He's the creator. Who are we? We are the creation. Two parts here. We are his creation, and not just creation, but we are his children. See in that verse 28? He says, for in him we live and move and exist. For we also are his children. One of my favorite verses, life verses, and I, I, didn't, I forgot to give it to the overhead guys, but Ephesians 2.10 that talks about that we are his workmanship created in Christ to do good works that he sets before us that we just walk in them. But that first part that we are his workmanship, we, we are literally his poema. We are God's work of art. You are God's work of art. Creation. Who is God? The creator. Who are you? You're the creation. You're his children. And I would say with that, number three comes responsibility. If God is the creator, if we are the creation, then there is a responsibility. There's an obligation. He says, simply put, uh, verse 27, seek God. And verse 29 through 30, repent. Repent. It's turn to God. Seek him, verse 27, 29 and 30. He says, being the children, verse 29, of God, we ought not to think that divine nature is like gold or silver or stone or an image form of art, thought of man. Therefore, here's a conclusionary statement, verse 30, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. Repent. So that's our responsibility, that's our obligation. Finally, number four, Paul preached accountability. He says very clearly in verse 31 that there will be a time of judgment. Do you see that? Verse 31, because he has fixed the day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man, that should be a capital M in your Bible, talking about Jesus, whom he has appointed having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. There will be a time of judgment and accountability for each person individually. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. And there will be a time of judgment for this world. Revelation 19, verse 11. At the second coming of Christ... 
It says, I saw the heavens opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp to a sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God and Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is Jesus. So four basic truths that Paul brings to the Athenians. Who is God? He's the creator. Who are we? We're the creation. There's a certain responsibility in being his creation. There's an obligation to seek and to repent. And there will be accountability. Now, verse 32, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer. But others said, We shall hear you again concerning this. And so Paul went out of their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom also Dionysus and Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. Three different people groups in our text this morning. A couple different reactions, but the only two reactions to the message of Jesus. Either you receive it and believe it or you reject it. You, you can't hang out in the middle. You have to decide. Do you receive it and believe it or do you reject it? Jesus says in Matthew 12, he who is not with me is against me. I want to leave you with the words of Joshua this morning. Joshua 24 verse 14 says, now therefore Fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. And put away the gods which your father served beyond the river and in Egypt. And serve the Lord. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourself today whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The choice is yours, my friend. The choice is yours. Now, I understand many of you are here. You've made that choice. But maybe you haven't. You know, the Bible clearly points to the idea of confessing with your mouth that Jesus says, Lord, and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead, Jesus and the resurrection. It says, with those things, you are saved. Salvation. God's grace through his son, Jesus Christ. It's a thing of faith. If we decide that Jesus is our mode of salvation, if we decide that Jesus is the rightful king, well, then your world is turned upside down. But remember, his upside down is the right side up. Amen? Amen. Father God, thank you so much this morning for your word and the time that we could gather, God. God, I pray, Lord, is the we've committed ourselves to the reading and the hearing of your word that you would bless us. Lord, we understand there's a choice before us to to receive and believe or to reject. God, we receive you this morning and we believe that you, Jesus Christ, are the king. That our forgiveness of sins is through you. That our salvation is through you. Thank you, God, that you have this plan of grace. God, would you bless everyone here? Lead them, guide them this week. God, we lift up Uh, our time this Wednesday, Lord, with the apologetics forum, God, that you would use that. You would use that to bring glory to you and to draw people unto you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.